Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on Christian education. And last week we talked about more lesson, uh, uh, lessons from the Master Teacher. This week we're going to talk about more lessons from the Master Teacher, and this is lesson number six in that series for November 7 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, once again, we are excited to pick up another group of lessons that we should learn from your Son and his experiences with human beings here on this earth. Even in the Old Testament, he had clear experiences. Help us to gather from these stories the truths you want us to know. Make them a part of our lives. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever done anything for which you were ashamed? I mean, I, don't, I think that must be a universal experience, right? Try to imagine how Adam and Eve felt. Just try to imagine hiding, trying to cover themselves with fig leaves as God approached. I just, you know, it just you can't imagine it even. And that was a, a kind of a new experience, wasn't it? Yeah. And yet they had, they had a fear. Uh -huh. I mean, it wasn't a, yeah. a learned a, a no, fear. No reason to fear before that. Well, think about Jacob at the age of approximately 70. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And not yet married, having tricked his father, gotten his father's blessing and birthright and running from his brother's anger. Yeah. You think he was happy at that point in time? Think about the woman caught in adultery, quote, in the very act, John 8, 4. And think of David as well, and see his confession, Psalm 32 and 51. So I don't think it's a revel. I certainly hope it's not a revelation to any of us that we're all sinners, Romans 3, 23. So in Genesis 3, 1 to 11, we have the story of, of sin, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with it, but... We're going we're gonna to break that down piece by piece here and, and talk about it. That is the story of the first sin on this earth. Eve ate the fruit, gave it to her husband who also ate it, and they both realized that they had lost the covering of light that had been around them. Then they were embarrassed when God came looking for them. And if you read Ellen White's comments about that covering light, she says the light helped Everything it helped explain to them everything that they saw somehow or other when they when they would approach a tree or something else like this, the light around them would help to explain what that's all about. And I don't know. I'm looking forward to find out how that actually works. What do you think happened in Eve's mind? Was she thinking, well, I don't, I don't need anyone to have some. I don't need to have someone tell me what to do. Why would she stop trusting God and start trusting a talking serpent? Mm. I mean, if she had stopped to think about what she was doing, I'm sure she, would have, she wouldn't have done it. I often wonder how green those pair were when they first got uh, made. Yeah. There had to be some of that lying around somewhere in that. But you would yeah. think not. They got plenty of coaching of what to do, as far as we know. You know, I, I think about all the trees that, that were bearing fruit in that garden. Yeah. Did they just get to the perfectly ripe stage and then just hold their fruit waiting for Adam and Eve to come? I'm sure fruit wasn't getting rotten in the, <laughs> yeah. in the, in the garden. Uh, it leads you to all kinds of things. We won't have septic tanks up there. I mean, there's a whole scenario you, we yeah. don't know. Yeah. So why do you suppose God was asking them, where are you? He knew, of course, exactly where they were. Maybe he asked that question just to focus on their problem and what they had done. In the New Testament, Paul wrote about the contrast between what Adam did and what Jesus Christ did. I'm going to take a moment to read those verses of Romans 5, 11 and following. But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. Sin came into the world through one man, and his sin brought death with it. 
As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. There was sin in the world before the law was given, but where there is no law, no account is kept of sins. We talked about that last week. Jim, remember? Mm -hmm. But from the time of Abraham to the time of Moses, death ruled over the whole human race, even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam did when he disobeyed God's command. <clears throat> Adam, it was Adam. You made a boo-boo there. I'm sorry? You, instead of Adam, you said Abraham. I'm sorry. Adam was a figure of the one who was to come, but the two are not the same because God's free gift is not like Adam's sin. It is true that many people died because of the sin of that one man, but God's grace is much greater, and so is his free gift that so many people through the grace of the one man, uh, to so many people through the grace of one man, Jesus Christ. And there is a difference between God's gift and the sin of one man. After the one sin came the judgment of guilty. guilty. But after so many sins comes the undeserved gift of not guilty. It is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by the one man, Jesus Christ? All who receive God's abundant grace and are freely put right with him will rule in life through Christ. So then, as the one sin condemned all people in the same way, the one righteous act sets all people free and gives them life. And just as the mass of people were made sinners as a result of the disobedience of one man, in the same way the mass of people will all be put right with God as a result of the obedience of one man. Wow. Do we always recognize God's presence with us? When we are tempted to sin, do we ever wish we could hide from God's presence? Think about that. That is a universal problem of sin and guilt. But fortunately, we know that Jesus is the answer. Okay, let's look at a story. Think of the story of Jacob. Genesis 28, 10 to 17. Jim? Jacob left Beersheba and started toward Haran. At sun he, sunset, to, he came to a pl holy place and camped there. He lay down to sleep, resting his head on a stone. He dreamt that he saw a stairway reaching from earth to heaven with angels going up and down on it. And there was the Lord standing beside him. I am the Lord, the Lord God of Abraham and Isaac, he said. I will give you and to your descendants this land on which you are lying. They will be as too numerous as the specks of, the, of dust on the earth. They will extend their territory in all directions, and through you and their descendants I will bless all the nations. Remember, I will be with you and protect you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I, am not, I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. Jacob woke up and said, Lord, the Lord is here. He is in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, What a terrifying place this is. It must be the house of God. It must be the gate that opens into heaven. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. When reading this story for the first time, or even after a number of times, if you have not done the math, you might think that Jacob was a teenager, or maybe in his early 20s. Why did he need his mother to tell him what to do? How old was Jacob when this story took place? He must have been about 70 years old. And here's a quote, quoting an Evangelical Review of Theology who put these verses together. I mean, this is, this is just somebody doing the math for us. Moses does not tell us the age of Jacob at the birth of Joseph. Now, this is talking about some years later when Joseph is actually born but he very neatly works it into the story. Look at Genesis 41, 46. He gave Joseph the Egyptian name, Egyptian name zaphnath Paneah, and he gave his wife, him a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of the city of Hierapolis. Joseph was 30 years old when he began to serve the king of Egypt, he left the king's court, and traveled all over the land. Okay? Joseph was 30 years old. If we go to 45, verse 6, this is, only, this is now he's talking about the, the time when the brothers came down and Joseph is ruling in the land. 
This is only the second year of famine in the land. There will be five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor reaping. Okay, five more years. So we go to 47 verse 9. Jacob, Jacob answered, My life of wandering has lasted 130 years. Those years have been few and difficult, unlike the long years of my ancestors and their wanderings. Now, if you take 130 and you subtract 30 and you subtract, what, five more? Something like this. But if you, if you work it all out, you find out that J Jacob was 91 at the birth of, of uh, simply by addition and subtraction, we find it to be 91. We expected to do the sum. We are expected to do the sum for ourselves. So, 91 years old when he had his, when he gave birth to Joseph. Yeah. So in our passage, Jacob was running for his life from his brother and was threatening to, who was threatening to kill him. He found a stone for a pillow, hopefully in a semi-comfortable shape, <laughs> and laid down to try to get some sleep. Then he had that vision in the ladder, of the ladder, and God's voice telling him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac, Genesis 28, 13. Jacob must have remembered that kind of greeting for stories he had heard from his family. Then God went on to promise him that he would never leave him. Many years later, Paul... Gary. Okay. Many years later, Paul beholds the ladder of Jacob's vision representing Christ, who has connected earth with heaven and finite man with the infinite God. His faith is strengthened as he calls to mind how patriarchs and prophets have relied upon the one who is his support and consolation and for whom he is giving his life. That's from Ellen White's Acts of the Apostles, page 512, paragraph 1. Yeah. When Jacob awoke, how do you suppose he felt? The text tells us that he recognized that God was in that place. So he named it Bethel, or the house of God. God. If we had time, we would review the life of Jacob. But for now, let us ask the question, why should God bless Jacob with this dream and promise when he had just left home because of lying to his father and angering his brother? Well, think about John 1, 1 to 14 all the background. We, we talked about that last week, and I wish we had time. We'll, re we'll read a little part of it. Matthew and Luke start their Gospels with the story of Jesus' birth. Mark does not bother. He just jumps into the story. But John was determined that we have, we have to go back and recognize the truth that John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in the creation was made without Him. Goodness, Bible. And I have to tell you a really quick story. It, you here have already heard, but you might, there might not have heard. There's a story told about a black pastor down in the South in the United States who was preaching on the, Christ's visit to the temple at age 12 when he went for his bar mitzvah. And um, he was, of course, there in the temple, and now he's being questioned by the scribes and Pharisees there, and they're pretty soon recognizing that he knows the scriptures better than they do. And finally, one of them, according to this black, black pastor, he says, son, how old are you? And Jesus hesitated for a moment. He says, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, <laughs> I'm older than time. <laughs> I just love that story. I have to work it in any time I get a chance. So here, in the beginning was the word. In, on my father's side, I'm older than time. Yeah. What an introduction. We all should agree that Jesus was the greatest teacher this world has ever seen. So why do you think John was forced to say, his own people did not receive him, John 1, 11. What other factors were in play leading to that conclusion? What, would po what could possibly have led the people of Israel to reject Jesus, by and large? Pride. Pride? Yeah. Unfortunately, I think they had 
so convinced themselves of what the Messiah was going to be and how he was going to behave that anyone who didn't fit that picture just could not be accepted. That is so sad. So sad. Yeah, because this was because of pride. Hey, who are you? You're trash. Yeah. We are look at us kind of yeah. thing. You see. Yeah. As yeah. they just could not accept it. Yeah. It's a bad case if I was con conceited. Uh, uh, what's the word? I want proud of myself. Is another version. Yeah. Con uh, conceited. But, but that, yes, conceited. Now I'm perfect. Yeah, that's, that's the I used to be conceited, theory. but now I'm perfect, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 years ago, the God who had spoken to Adam and Eve as they walked in the cool of the evening and who appeared in a dream to Jacob appeared as a human being. He lived that incredible life, trying to witness to the truth about his father. When Jesus was about to begin his ministry, he traveled to the Jordan River near Jericho and asked to be baptized by John the Baptist, his predecessor. John had stirred up the entire nation, attracting people from all corners to hear his preaching. What do you think those people thought when, Jesus, when seeing Jesus for the first time? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Yes. What do they think? Mm. What we know is that several of John's disciples soon began following Jesus. They called him Rabbi, which translated means teacher, John 138. Imagine having God as your teacher. Well, we've already seen in previous lessons that when Jesus was a child, God the Father was his teacher and so were the angels. We also have the information that he learned from his mother's knee the very words that he had spoken to Moses. Think about that. He, Mom, what'd you say? I said those words to Moses. I mean, d did he have that kind of self-recognition? I don't know. I, I am looking forward to watching him step by step as he grew in that panorama of the great controversy. It will be fantastic. Well, Ellen White goes on in Signs of the Times to call him the greatest teacher the world has ever seen, and I don't think any of us would argue with that. So wouldn't it be wise to do our very best to learn from his example? You out there, what do you think? After being baptized by John, Jesus went first to the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil, you know, in those 40 days, and then he returned to the Jordan. Finally, he went to Galilee once again. When Passover came in the spring, about six months later, he had traveled back to Jerusalem and began his ministry in earnest. For the next year, he worked, I would call it, under the radar in Judea because he did not want to stir up too much animosity among the Pharisees and Sadducees. He worked a whole year like that without, without being followed by a bunch of crowds. He had not chosen any disciples. Now, some of, the, some of his followers, who would later be disciples, uh, followed him from time to time, but mostly, almost a year, he was traveling around Judea, trying to, to, to preach and teach people without, without making himself too visible. At the end of that year, John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison. Jesus felt it was appropriate at that point of time, considering the animosity that was going on, to move his ministry from Judea to Galilee. It is during that next year that we have most of the events recorded in the book in Matthew, Mark, and Luke taking place. At the end of that year, John the Baptist was beheaded. After feeding the 5,000 and then giving them that sermon about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, Jesus took his disciples out of Jewish territory, going northwest into the territory of Tyre and Sidon, where God had directed him uh, to see that woman whose daughter was possessed with a demon. I'm going to, we've got a little bit of time. I'm going to read those verses. Jesus left that place and went off to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Actually, I think we included that in our, no, we didn't. I'll read it. Territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman who lived in that region came to him. Son of David, she cried out, have mercy on me, sir. My daughter has a demon and is in a terrible condition. 
But Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples came to him and begged him, Send her away. She's following us and making all this noise. And then Jesus replied, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. At this the woman came and fell at his feet. Help me, sir, she said. Jesus answered, It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That's true, sir, she answered, but even the dogs eat the leftovers that fall from their master's table. So Jesus answered her, You are a woman of great faith. What you want will be made will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was healed. Now we're going to break that story down here a little bit. During the next six months, Jesus focused primarily on teaching his disciples and spent most of his time outside of Jewish territory. It even seemed like he was trying to hide from all the people who would have liked to have been healed by him. Mark 7. I think that's mine, isn't it? No, that's Jim's. Jim's. Mark 7, 24 to 30. Then Jesus left and went away to the territory near the city of Tyre. He went into a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, but he could not stay hidden. Woman, excuse me, a woman whose daughter had an evil spirit in her heard about Jesus and came to him at once and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, born in the region of Phoenicia in Syria. Can I interrupt for a second? <clears throat> sure. I have wondered how did she know about Jesus? Now, other places we read that people flocked to him from all those territories, from Tyre and Sidon, from as far away as Syria and down as far away as Idumea, way down in the south, and so forth. So it must have been from somebody who had, who had come to him and gotten healed. How many years was, was this into his ministry? Was it about a year, year this, and a half? No, this, this was two years. Two in, years. Well, well, actually, two and a half years into his ministry yeah, so, already. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of other competing ideas floating around. And this is there pretty important. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. healing the sick and raising the dead. Uh, that word gets around pretty rapidly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah I think about today, it would, be, it would be number one on every, every television. Even on the fake news stations. Yeah. And where did they come from? They call it Bush Telegraph. Yeah. And people, I think, travel longer distances than we give them credit for particularly later when Rome was in. I mean, Rome had roads everywhere. Yeah. And word got around. Well, what do they say today? You got telephone, you got television, then you got tele-Adventist. <laughs> Tele-Adventist tell things pretty rapidly, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, where did we start? The woman was a Gentile born in the region of Phoenicia and Syria. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus answered, let us first feed the children at it, it isn't, excuse me, it isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Sir, she answered, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. So Jesus said to her, because of that answer, go back home. There, me, where you will find that the demon has gone out of your daughter. She went home and found her daughter lying on the bed the demon had indeed gone out of her. Wow. In this Bible. <clears throat> but doesn't verse 24 suggest that Jesus was trying to stay out of the public eye? Seems like it, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Read the full story if you have a chance. As explained by Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 399 to 403. It's a great story. The woman belonged to the ancient group known as the Canaanites. These were the people who were supposed to have been driven out or destroyed by the children of Israel under Joshua 1,400 years earlier. 1,400 years later, here they are. She's still there. This area of Tyre and Sidon mostly contained Greek-speaking city dwellers. They lived down on the coast. They did, they did a lot of fishing and so forth, and they did commerce. They tra their ships traveled all over the Mediterranean doing commerce. They looked down on the Jewish farmers from whom they purchased most of their food. They, couldn't, they didn't have good growing areas, so the, the Jews up in the, in the plains up there go, grew most of their food. They would sell their food down to the, to the Phoenicians and so forth down there, and the Phoenicians in turn would sell other items to the, the farmers. Um, they looked down on the Jewish farmers, but the Jewish farmers in return looked down on them. I think mm. Solomon got his timber from there, didn't yeah. he? 
When that woman approached Jesus, she received that strange response from him, which we have read. Jesus was trying to show his disciples the contrast between the way most Jews would have dealt with her and the way he ultimately did treat her. This woman did something remarkable. She had desperate hopes of finding help for her daughter. When Jesus appeared to rebuff her, she spoke back. <laughs> she, wasn't, she wasn't taking no for an answer, right? Quick on the uptake. <laughs> the Jews were not in the habit of keeping dogs as pets in those days. You need to understand that. But when Jesus suggested that it was not fair to toss food intended for the children to the puppies, her comment was, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs, the puppies, eat the crumbs from their master's table. Matthew 15, 27, NRSV. I have changed the word dogs to puppies because the Greek word means little dogs or puppies. Mm. So if you actually had the Greek, you would see that. We know, of course, that Jesus, having made his point, healed her daughter. Is this one of the two places where Jesus is in, I have not seen such great faith among Israel? The other one was the daughter the, of no, the, the centurion or servant of the centurion. The, the centurion was who had the one who had the faith. His servant was, was here. Right. Yeah. But uh, no, it was the woman where she touched his, 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 the hem of his garment. Lord, okay. Yeah. Is yes. that, I, I think, one of two places the Lord says, I have not seen such great faith in Israel. Yes. Yeah. Your faith had made you whole. Was that what yeah. I think she, she was head of. No, that was who touched me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. About six months after that story took place, Jesus <coughs> began attracting large crowds. And he did that on purpose. They had, and they followed him. He spent most of his time on the east side of the Jordan River out of Jewish territory so the Jewish rulers could not easily arrest him. So here we have some words. I'm reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. I want you to know the, notice those words. Read it one more time. He made this very clear to them. Hmm. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> but Jesus turned around, looked at his disciples, and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan. He said, your thoughts don't come from God, but from human nature. And that's from the Good News Bible. Notice that Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be arrested, killed, and three days later would rise to life. Okay? This is months before the actual event. In verse 32 it says, he made this very clear to them. Okay? Keep those words in mind. But for those next six months with the crowds hanging on his every word and following wherever he went, the rumor began to spread that Jesus was going to go up to Jerusalem and be crowned king. So on that journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, Jesus called his disciples aside, and we have this story, Luke 18. Charles? 31 through 34. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen. We are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise to life. But the disciples didn't understand any of these things, the meaning of the words, were, was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. What happened? He made this very clear to them, and six months later, when we're actually on the journey, going from Jericho up to Jerusalem, and Jesus says, here they, they're in a huge crowd. Yes. And, and why, is, why, are, why is Jesus allowing himself to move with this huge crowd? This is a really important point. We need, we need to understand this. He wants to make sure that when they, he is arrested and he's crucified, he everyone will know about it. Yeah. So here are all these people, and what are they talking about? We're going to get him to Jerusalem, and we're going to get him crowned king. king. 
Yeah. That's what everybody's talking about. And meanwhile, Jesus pulling the disciples aside. What is he saying? I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be killed. Yeah. And there, they went. Whoosh. Yeah. And this was uh, Passover was about coming, right? Mm -hmm. So everything. This was going to be a climactic event, and uh, what really pulled the whole thing, I think. He knew that I just need some more time, so he tarried for four days. Mm -hmm. when, uh, Ma when Mary sent a text mm -hmm. saying, please come, my brother is dying. So everything, that's the time I bet this is, this is the guy. Yeah. When you yeah. get big crowds, that's when you get rumors. Yeah. You well, here's this huge crowds, and the disciples, you know, they're just, they're so excited they can hardly contain themselves. Uh -huh. We are going there, and finally... We're going, to, we're going to get our, which one of us is going to be a prime minister? That's right. We're going to get our positions. We're going to rule this country. Oh, boy, we're going to be rich. Oh, man. And Jesus says, and they're going to kill me. They're what? <laughs> and then Peter couldn't believe it. He starts to rebuke. Yeah. How do you ever say that? <laughs> As they were leaving Jericho, blind Bartimaeus heard the crowd going by and learned that Jesus was among them. He shouted, Jesus, son of David, Take pity on me. Mark, Mark 10, 47 and Luke 18, 38. So, if you read the passages there, if we had time, we do not know how long Bartimaeus had been blind, but what is clear is that this man who was physically blind received his physical sight. There were many in the crowd accompanying Jesus to Jerusalem who were spiritually blind, and many of them refused to receive their spiritual eyesight. Okay, Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Do we have any other groups like that? Here's Paul, and I'm, I'm, we don't know for sure who wrote the book of, of Hebrews. It sounds like, the theology sounds like Paul. The arguments sound like Paul. But the language sounds like Greek. I'm sorry, sounds like Luke, a very sophisticated Greek physician. And many verse, words that are used in Hebrews are used in Acts and Luke, which would would put it with Luke. So I think Paul and Luke probably work together in, in, in this in the writing of the book of Hebrews. So anyway, now they're writing to a group of young people who are pro being studying, probably planning to be missionaries. There's been enough time for you to be teachers that you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. How do they learn to distinguish between good and evil? Practice. Practice. It is thought that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul, probably with the assistance of Luke, speaking to a group of young men who are training to be missionaries to carry the gospel to the world. And why do you think they were so slow in learning the truth? Why do we have all these examples of delays in getting the picture? Because the devil was doing his best, his very best, to defeat the gospel story. I mean, think about it. When Jesus was born, the devil thought, okay, I've, I've just about got this. I've just about got this. And then there's the whole Jesus thing. And now, okay, Jesus is gone now. Oh, I, there's only just a few of them left. I, I Surely I can do something. How successful has the devil been at delaying our preparation for the second coming? It has now been 176 years yes. since the great disappointment in October 1844. If you can, read the chapter entitled The Test of Discipleship pages 57 and 65 and Steps to Christ to, to get this picture filled out. Early in his ministry to the people in Galilee, Jesus gave that Sermon on the Mount. And that was, that was his message to the, his, his first disciples. Few people would deny the fact that it is an incredible charter, if you will, for the Christian life. So why are we so slow in getting ready for the Second Coming? What are the criteria for entrance into the kingdom of God? Jim? The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been. Just what it was in par paradise before the fall of our first parents. 
perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be opened for sin with all it, excuse me, with all it can, it's, okay. its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. Ellen White Steps to Christ, page 62. So what are we saying here? We're saying God cannot admit to heaven people who are still sinners. The great controversy would just go on. It wouldn't, well, also, be, wouldn't be over. The, the, it would be hell for him. Yeah. It, it really, people choose either to live for eternity or choose to get away from it and die. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, God doesn't need to, doesn't have this wall, a barrier to keep everybody out that no. doesn't, you know, if you don't want to be there, he'll honor your choice. Yeah. Yeah. And Ellen White says, if the devil were admitted to heaven, it would be supreme torture for him. Yeah. There's no question about the fact that God is waiting for us. Second Peter 3, 9, just one, one verse. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. So how can we make the message of Jesus compelling enough to arouse people's excitement and attention? There's an enormous variety of people in our world in terms of education, language, culture, and habits. Paul helps us to realize that God knows that. But all of us are Christ's body, and each one, of, one is a part of it. And, of course, there's several places. Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. He talks about a human body. We need eyes. We need ears. We need the brain. We need heart. We need lungs. We need liver. We need intestines. We need feet and legs and each one of these parts does a different job, and it should be the same in the church. As soon as he had recovered his sight, Bartimaeus was ready to follow Jesus. Shouldn't that be our experience as well? So why are we delaying? God cannot admit to heaven anyone who is not ready to abandon his or her sins. If all do not, it would be, it would just, uh, if any didn't, I, I should say, do not, it would just lead to the great controversy starting all over again. The only safe criteria for entering entrance into the kingdom of God are those set forth by Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, and I add, might add for the, in the rest of Scripture. Could it be that God is still calling out to us today as he did to Adam and Eve, where are you? Or why did you do this? What would happen if every time we committed a sin, God would say, why did you do that? It's one thing to admit that we are sinful and that we have a fallen nature. But it is much harder to admit that we are part of the problem that needs to be fixed. Yeah, yeah uh, I have fallen. I'm, a sin I'm sinful. But so is everyone else, right? And of course, the opposite side of that coin is that God loves everyone. He loves me. Can we just be comfortable in this crowd of sinners? Well, didn't Jesus teach us the way? Didn't he show us the way by his example? Through his life, his death, his resurrection, didn't he make it possible for every human being to be saved? Does the plan of salvation make it possible for every human being to be saved? And the only way for us to succeed is to follow his example by focusing on his life and death and all that it means for, every, for, for us every day. In considering this issue, Paul in Romans 5, 12 through 21, took a look back in time and compared the experiences of Adam and Jesus. Romans 5, 12 to 21. Sin came into the world through one man, Adam and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. There was sin in the world before the law was given, but where there is no law, no account is kept of sins. But from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, death ruled over the whole human race. 
even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam did when he disobeyed God's command. Adam was a figure of the one who was to come. But the two are not the same because God's free gift is not like Adam's sin. It is true that many people died because of the sin of the one man, but God's grace is much greater and so is his free gift to so many people through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. And there is a difference between God's gift and the sin of one man after the one sin came the judgment of guilty. But after so many sins comes the undeserved gift of not guilty. It is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of the, that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by the one man, Jesus Christ? All who receive God's abundant grace and are freely put right with him will rule in life through Christ. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. It is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by the one man, Jesus Christ? Mm. Do we think about the implications of that? How many people are going to be lost because of the one sin? How many people are going to be saved because of what Jesus did? So if it's a lot greater, the ones who are saved is a lot greater than the ones who are lost, but there's a lot more people being going to be lost than are going to be saved. What's he trying to say to us? Any idea? Well, here's a thought anyway. Each person's life is very valuable. And when God saves a person, all uh, Revelation 5 says there's rejoicing in, well, even, even Luke 15 says there's rejoicing in heaven over one person that's saved. One person that's saved. It says it twice. Um, well, and, if, we, if we use the term uh, healed, mm -hmm. and the healing has to do with the way we think, Mm -hmm. And the, well, we talk about faith, mm -hmm. but well, the first thing is persuasion. Are we persuaded because we learned the lessons that Jesus came to teach? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to be that some level of understanding there. Uh, Jesus came in the beginning was the Word, the Word's worth God, and so forth. God communicates through words, yeah. which are symbols of ideas, and uh, He does that. Teach. We learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Or you want to learn from the serpent. Yeah. You know. Well, so God says he <clears throat> prizes those who are saved so greatly. He, 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 he's very sorry about all who are going to be lost, but the ones who are being going to be saved are such a glorious prize in his eyes that it seems like it's more important than all the ones who are going to be lost. The joy in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, well, to me, a couple of things come to mind. Power of choice. Mm-hmm. But the ones who have the power of choice know what Christ has done, know his name. But there are countless mm -hmm. who have never heard his name, who will perhaps never hear his name till he comes, returns. And at the same time, we know that it says, what are those marks in your hand? Mm -hmm. Everyone knows, but these are the folk. I believe that there's going to be plenty of them. Yeah. What are those marks? So, uh, to me, to him, much has been given, much yeah. is going to be required. So, yeah. What we have is the spirit of truth is available to everybody, sure. even those that have never heard the name of Jesus. Yep. And, and the text we have for that is Romans 2, 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. Those who do what the law requires shows us the law is written on their heart. Sure. Just yeah. as, and and God, the, the spirit of truth is available. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and Ellen White has a great story about about that. And, and so anyway, that's uh, yeah. that's a very bit of important text me, to me. Okay, sorry, Charles, we interrupted you. So there. then, as the one sin condemned all people, in the same way, the one righteous act sets all people free and gives them life. And just as the mass of people 
were made sinners as a result of the disobedience of one man, in the same way the mass of people will be put right, put right with God as a result of the obedience of one man. Law was introduced in order to increase wrongdoing. Hmm. But where sin increased, God's grace increased much more. So then, just as sin ruled by means of death, so also God's grace rules by means of righteousness, leading us to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hmm. Sin ruled by means of death, God's grace rules by means of righteousness. Are we, think about this yourself, are we taking full advantage of the provisions that Jesus made available to us? As difficult as it is for the adherent to the evolutionary, progressive, humanistic worldview to admit, evil is real. And it proceeds directly out of the center of the human heart, which is really here, as Jim keeps pointing out. We're not victims, we are perpetrators. Jesus, the master teacher, said it like this, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. Wow. So, what's happening? I mean, we can, we can look out there and say, you know, we need to fix all these problems that are out there. We need to fix the problems that are in here. If we all would fix the problems in here, there wouldn't be any problems out there, right? So in a sense, we are all victims because everyone's sins send out ripples that affect everyone else. Think about the news. Every day on the news, some awful thing happens and it, it impacts a whole lot of other people. Obviously, some are more deeply affected than others. We acknowledge that, but even in the midst of our pain, it is helpful to remember that our sins have hurt others. Lest we grab our fellow man by the throat and say, pay me that thou owest, Matthew 18, 28, and forget that we ourselves have been forgiven 10,000 talents, Matthew 18, 24. This is our adult teacher Sabbath school Bible study guide, pages 80 and 81. Wow. Hmm. As loving as God is, he cannot minimize the impact of sin. Why not? He just can't admit sin to heaven. There's no, it damages us. It, it damages us too much. He just can't let sinners back into heaven. It would just cause too much of a mess up there. When we get to heaven, will Adam and Eve feel that they need to go keep apologizing to all of God's redeemed children for the mess they got us into? No, heard. because all of sin, so we can't bl can't blame. Well, what what do you do? Ezekiel eighteen and Ezekiel what thirty one is thirty three. The son is not going to die for the sins of the father. Father's not going to die for the sins of the son. Everybody is that. In Romans, Romans, Romans five. Romans why five. why are we all guilty? Because we've all sinned. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Well. Adam and Eve will not have any idea how bad it has been until they become acquainted with the mess that we have created. Look at this sequence as modified from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 81. So we're going to look through some things. How did it all start out? Carrie? I think you, no, was it Jim? I guess it's mine. Genesis uh, 131. God looked at everything he had made and, it, and he was very pleased. Evening passed, and morning came. That was the sixth day. Good news, Bible. Okay. So, at the end of creation week, was everything in good shape? Forbidden fruit was eaten in Well, Genesis just wait. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. At the end of creation, I'm asking a question. At the end of creation week, was everything in great shape? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, at the end of the sixth day, it was, very, it was good. very good. Mm-hmm. Okay, Carrie, I think you're next. Yes. Uh, Number two. From, yes, Genesis 3. Forbidden verse, fruit eaten. Yeah. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. 
So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, and he also ate it. That's from the Good News Bible. So now sin has come into the world, right? Yes. They were commanded not to part from each other. That's right. Right? Yep. So that was the first mistake. Problem. Yeah, first mistake. Charles, hiding and blaming, huh? Hiding and blaming, yes. We have not learned. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. That evening they heard the Lord God walking in the garden, and they hid from him among the trees. But the Lord called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid and hid from you because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? God asked. <laughs> <laughs> Did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? Ah, oh, it's the woman. The man answered, the woman you put here with me gave me the fruit, <laughs> and I ate it. The Lord asked the woman, why did you eat, do this? She replied, the snake tricked me into eating it. Good news, Bible. Blame everybody else, <laughs> right? Yeah. And what happens next? We have murder. murder. Genesis 4, 8. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the fields. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. Um, incredible from that perfect universe one generation not even one complete generation and now we have fratricide as we call it it destroyed one-fourth of human beings yep Jim risk of murder Genesis 4 14 and 15 you are driving me off the land and away from your presence I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth and anyone who finds me will kill me but the Lord answered, no. Now, let's be clear. God is speaking. Uh, this is a conversation between right. God and Cain. Right. Lord answered, no, if anyone kills you, seven lives will be taken on, in revenge. So the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who met him not to kill him. Okay. <laughs> and then what happens next, Carrie? Man, man. Wait a minute. Murder and manslaughter and a call for 77-fold vengeance. Yes. You wonder about the difference. Yeah. Genesis 4, 23 to 24. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. I have killed a young man because he struck me. If seven lives are taken to pay for killing Cain, 77 will be taken if anyone kills me. Okay, so what's he saying? I'm more important than Cain, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 77 lives if anyone kills me. Wow. Charles? Genesis 8, 21. No, oh, global wickedness. Did, yours is number seven, I think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I was given... That's fine. That's fine. Uh, global wickedness, thoughts only continually evil. Genesis 6, 5. And then uh, Genesis 6, 5, when the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time. Wow. Well, traditional Christian uh, chronology suggests that there was about 1,700 years between creation and the flood. We, we're not going to go into all the pos other possibilities, but it's just that's a traditional thought. During that time, did God just stand back and watch evil multiply? He kind of did, did he? I mean, and he did not intervene. Well, we don't, we don't know about it. In a relatively short period of time, after the creation of a perfect world, God had to send a flood and basically start over by turning the world back into its embryonic form. Mm. But then with his incredible love, God did not destroy the next generation of sinners. He just scattered them out across the earth. Genesis 8, 21. The odor of the sacrifice pleased the Lord, and he said to himself, Never again will I put the earth under a curse because of what people do. I know that from the time they are young, their thoughts are evil. Never again will I destroy all living beings as I have done this time. And then to add to that, Genesis 11, 8. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. <coughs> So why did scattering people across the globe reduce the amount of wickedness? Bible-believing Christians realize that God created a perfect world in the beginning. He said so as recorded in 
many places there in Genesis 1. But because we have already read Revelation 12, 7 to 12, and you remember that's the place where it talks about how evil began where? In heaven. In heaven. In heaven. Right beside the throne of God in heaven. We know that sin did not start on this earth, it began in heaven. Skeptics and doubters will try to blame God for all the evil on this earth, if they even admit that he exists. What they are really trying to do is to deflect the blame from themselves. There is a great irony in comparing the biblical view of origins with other Mesopotamian flood narratives. You probably know, if you are fairly familiar with ancient history and so forth, that there are a number of cultures around the world that have ideas about some kind of flood that happened way back. The difference is this. The biblical view makes it clear that following the flood, things went from bad to worse. The Mesopotamian flood narrative suggests that things were getting better and better. Which version of truth has proven true? One day after the great controversy has ended, God plans to appear in the clouds and take his faithful people home so that after the millennium he could come back and turn this world into the perfect Eden it was in the beginning. So now I have a question for you. Think about it out there. <clears throat> what would happen if our Sabbath school class members decided to immerse themselves individually in the study of the life experiences of Jesus, what happens when you focus on something for a long period of time and you just make that a part of your everything you see and think? What happens? It becomes our second nature. By beholding, We're we changed. become changed. changed. By beholding, we become changed. We recognize that in trying to follow Jesus, we will not do a perfect job in the beginning. Jesus doesn't say, doesn't say you have to be an expert athlete when you're still trying to learn how to walk. One way to improve the quality of our witness is to practice teaching others. Are we prepared to do that? So, for those of you who had some experience in teaching, I've had a lot of experience in teaching, the best way to cement some idea in your mind is to do what? Share. Teach it to somebody else. If you understand it clearly enough so you can teach it to somebody else, you've got it. At least you're well on your way to having it. And I have had so many times experiences, whoops, I forgot a part of it. What do I do now? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to follow your example. May we become more like you. We thank you for these lessons which have clearly set out so many aspects of your teaching. And Lord, we live so far down in the history of the human race. Why do we need to keep delaying your second coming? We know you're waiting for us. We're not waiting for you. Send the Holy Spirit to impress upon our minds a need to get out there and do what needs to be done, representing you to the, to the crowds, to the many people on this earth who need to hear about your truth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.